Name and college, please. Uh, sorry. I'm Mohini from Newton. And um, this is the point I needed to make really early on because a lot of debate went on without discussing this, which was Islam, uh, its beliefs as a religion, and whatever its tenets are, and uh, Muslim countries where Muslims live, but they don't call themselves the Islamic Republic or whatever. So, like Iraq was a Baptist country, secular, um, socialist, <coughs> when the um, US invaded Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan is not invaded because Taliban have some uh, radical uh, Islamist ideas. It is invaded because Taliban is supposed to be involved in 9 11. So, when you ask Indonesia to come and fight in uh, Afghanistan, it's a political issue. But you're saying Indonesia is again a Muslim country. It is not a Muslim country. I mean, even if there are Muslims living there, it is, it is a country which has democracy. You know? So you really need to um, make the point clear about what a Muslim country, where Muslims live probably in a majority or minority or whatever, and what is an Islamic country where they say Islam is a religion and we are going to follow the tenets of Islam. And on the basis of that, if they do something which you do not, do not agree with, but then you can probably raise the point. But I, I guess all the countries that you mentioned, you mentioned Turkey. Again, um, Turkey is a democracy. It's not going to call itself Islam, the Republic of Turkey. So I think you're really mixing everything together and, you know, um, that's the point I need to come. Thank you. Closing the case for the proposition, Mr. Arash Jassi. Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you all very much for coming, first of all. Um, we've raised many interesting points uh, on all sides, some of which I must admit I've been struggling to follow. I'd also like to thank the uh, honourable gentleman over there for suggesting Turkey as my next summer holiday destination. <laughs> <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, many of you would be surprised to see me debate on this side of the chamber, given that I, throughout my entire life, have grown up in a rather religious Muslim family. I've read the Quran first, aged eight years old, they carried with me everywhere. The Mehraj, one of the most important prayers in Islam, in my pocket every day. I've grown up with Islam ever since I was a little boy. And to top it all off, for 19 years now, I've been the citizen of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So I've had the experience of knowing what Islam can do in the spiritual and personal sense, both at home, and also its impact in day-to-day -day political life in countries where Islam is the dominating political paradigm. Now, I've understood the stigma that goes on with Islam. I've appreciated the oppression that many people fear today. And I too was initially wary of debating against the religious and belief system that I've grown up with my entire life. And, but then eventually, as I thought this motion more and more, I realised that actually to protect the true nature of Islam, the true philosophy, some might argue, that I had no choice other than to speak for the proposition. And I'm going to go along a frame of argument which many of you may not agree with, but I hope to show you perhaps will make sense and I hope by the end of my speech, you will come onto my side of thinking and eventually vote for the proposition. <coughs> Firstly, I'd like to define what I'm going to classify Islam as. We've already defined the West and we've had many definitions and I'm not sure there is too much controversy over that. But I'd like to define Islam as several things. Islam, first and foremost, is the religious beliefs and the philosophy that govern over a billion people in this world <coughs> and their beliefs. And it would be stupid, frankly, for me to argue against that. There are so many examples where we've seen that that can potentially work peacefully. Sufism, for example, is one of the most prime examples where the true nature of Islamic philosophy on its own can work and can be integrated with today's society. And in actual fact, there are millions of Muslims all over the world who do follow Islam peacefully. And that's my second point. Islam can also be classified as the community of people who follow that religion. 
There is the Islamic world, for example, those who constitute or consider themselves to be Muslims. And I'm not going to, again, argue against this. And I think this motion to argue for or against that is to miss the main point in this debate. To argue against it would be to argue against millions of moderate Muslims, some of which are sitting directly opposite me and have integrated beautifully and peacefully with society. But the problem that we have, and the reason why we would even consider that to be a major problem in today's day and age, ladies and gentlemen, is because we have a mass media that whenever they are requesting the view of Muslims, tends to be dominated by one nutter who has a hook on his left hand. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, you never really see these people. It's highly unlikely that my next swap at the Mahal is going to be with Cambridge University Society Al-Qaeda Girls Drinking Society. <laughs> And as fun, you know, I can't imagine that will be particularly lively. Although, I must admit, we could probably happily go off later that night, claiming to have partaken in the most intense game of Pass the Parcel. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am not going to argue against the religion or the scripture, for to do so would be to argue that because Christianity 600 years ago caused so many wars and crusades that the Bible, that Jesus, that Christians all over the world are inherent threats to the West. They are not. That is quite simply true. The reason why they were threats 600 years ago is due to the institutions in place at the time. And it is that argument that I wish to pursue for the proposition today. I wish to argue that Islam, as a political movement, as a movement which chooses to interfere with the day-to-day -day governing of people, rather than the realms of spiritual and personal enrichment, that is the threat to the West today. I'm going to argue that Islamification, that is the phrase that I will try to use to distinguish the two, is the threat to the West today. Now, the opposition will try and argue that Islamification isn't really Islam. Islam was never really intended to impinge on the day-to-day -day political and governing lives of people. It was meant to enrich their personal and social lives. But I would argue, despite the fact that many of these uh, sects we've mentioned, for example, in Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia, the Taliban, the Islamic Republics of Iran, say, though they do augment Islam in a way that it was not intended by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his followers, what it still means is there are millions of people around the world who take this to be Islam, and therefore it is perfectly legitimate to consider this an aspect of Islam. And though Islamic republics in themselves perhaps are contradictory in nature, many of them go against the values of the Quran when they <coughs> impinge on people's rights and sort of democratic uh, abilities and their inherent human rights. This is, whether we wish to appreciate or not, a new radical form of Islam. It may not be an idealised form, but it is a legitimate form of Islam. I'm going to now argue, which I hope will be the easiest point in my case, is to argue how those institutions are in fact a threat to the West. This, I feel, is the most obvious point. We can recall many different aspects of the news. For example, the impingements of the rights of women, of, of homosexuals, of children, the lack of the expression of, of human rights, the impingement in many aspects on liberal democracy. For example, even in the UK, though he's not with us today, initially was planted, the former head of the Muslim Council of Britain, Dr. Um, Dr. Barry advocated at one point that Britain should try to look into the possibility of using arranged marriages. This simply, I believe, is not compatible with a view of a liberal democracy that we have in this country. The whole point of liberal democracy is to enable people to separate their own views and to live their own enriched lives. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that religion, be it Islam, Christianity, Judaism, whatever, has no place in that statement. I believe that politicisation of religion is the inherent threat to the West because it impinges on those values which we hold most dear by living in this country. Sorry. On that point, yes. Even if I was going to accept all of your analysis as to why political Islam is wrong, firstly, do you not think by putting that way into a box to say it's wrong, it's bad, we should kill will have a negative impact on people Thank you. I'm going to come on to that point later. This is the point that I want to address right at the very end, why we have to address that point. The other major point that I want to raise in terms of the international world is a country which many people consider to be the greatest threat to the West right now, and that is my own country, the Islamic Republic of Iran. 
I have seen this country, and my family immediately has seen this country transform from what was 30 years ago a very prosperous, inclusive, progressive state that within 10 years was transformed by a movement claiming to be under the facade of Islam and therefore an Islamic Republic into one that oppresses its people, into one that puts an illegitimate ruler to downgrade the human rights of his citizens and one that attacks many nations verbally and threateningly across the world. And as for the argument that the proposition put before, talk, oh, sorry, the opposition, about how the Arab world has actually enriched society and the Western world, in actual fact, in the second invasion of, of the Persian Empire under the Arabs, the Arabs undertook huge amounts of book burning, then claiming much of Iranian civilization and discovery under their own tenure. To suggest that the Arabic world, or the Islamic world, was peaceful in that regard and enriched the world is, frankly, a little bit insulting that I find personal on that point. Yes. Thank you. So, I'll say that very quickly. Okay, yeah. But the Abbasid Empire made the Prime Minister Persians. They were Persians. The Baramics in the Abbasid Empire were Persians. The Arabs recognized the. Okay, okay sorry, that, that's that's that's, that's, that's wrong, so I'm going to stop you. Other. I'm going to stop you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, so I've, I've hoped I've tried to convince you that political Islam is an inherent threat to the West. Now, many of you may consider why that's an important thing. Surely, if you separate political Islam from the ideals, then you don't have a problem. Well, sadly, I don't think that's true. Wahhabism, for example, prints more Qurans and influences more Islamic sects around the world than any other institution. No, thank you. And as a result, has more of an influence on what people perceive to be the true Islam. Whether we like it or not, and despite the irony of it, Islamification of the philosophy of Islam is taking place. Islamification of Muslims and the supporters of true Islam is taking place. And the problem we've had with our policies to date, ladies and gentlemen, is we've chosen to ignore these problems. We've chosen to simply accept that they are completely distant from us. Thank you. That extremism is not our problem. It's a completely different group of people. But we, ladies and gentlemen, need to stop shying away from this problem and need to stop ignoring it. The Quran fundamentally states that one must obey the laws and the values of the nation with which you reside in. All this talk we've had of the oppression of people in nations because their views are not, and their beliefs aren't necessarily being upheld isn't exactly true. Given the Quran states you must obey the laws of that nation. If every Muslim, I tell you no, no thank you, tomorrow stood proudly and acknowledged the fact and the threat that Islamification, political Islamification, posed to Western liberal democracy, do we honestly feel that this debate will be taking place? If we saw that every Muslim today accepted that Islam as a political force was a threat to the West, irrespective of whether the religion or the followers are, I honestly do not believe we will be seeing this debate. It may be difficult, thank you. It may be hard to stomach and confusing. But I will not ask you to consider proposing this motion if you do not feel that it would be essential for the long-term health of Islam's philosophy and its followers to accept the distinction that needs to be made between the involvement of Islam in the state and the involvement of Islam into people's day-to-day -day lives. So ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to vote for human rights, to vote for gender equality, for peace, progress, change. I urge you to vote for Islam's philosophy. I urge you to vote for those who follow Islam peacefully and moderately. But I beg you, ladies and gentlemen, to vote against the political nature of Islam, the political implementation of Islam. I urge you to vote against Islamification. I urge you to vote with the proposition. Thank you. the opposition, Mr. Abdullah Al-Andalusi. Hello, greetings. I'm your friendly neighbourhood Islamist. <laughs> I was a bit late coming from London today, but you know, the queue of infidels to the head was rather longer than usual. <laughs> Now, I guess getting to more salient points, we've heard this very interesting uh, discussion. I think it can break it down to this. 
the people that, that came after me who were opposing the uh, proposition, um, they uh, were viewed as, or well, there's an allegation, these are not true Muslims, or they represent some fringe element of Islam. Well, I can, I'm going to be a little controversial, and if anyone has seen me uh, on, uh, on, on video and so on, not crime watch, but uh, the debates I've had, I've debated secularism, atheism, I've trans, my, my, I have a partial for political philosophy, and I am a convert to Islam uh, from uh, Portuguese descent. Uh, one contention, uh, you shouldn't call it Islamic Spain, but there is Portugal there too. Call it the Iberian Peninsula. Damn Spanish. Anyway. <laughs> or well, maybe some. Anyway. Now, essentially this, I believe in the Sharia. I believe in Orthodox Islam for, for 1,400 years. I believe in all the elements that, all the, the, that is unpopular that you've, you've seen. But... I'd like to explain that there is a big, big misunderstanding, and I'm going to be very antisocial, uh, but I am an Islamist after all, and I'm going to have to uh, not take people's points, because I've got a lot of things I want to refute, and uh, I basically, the organization I was part of does a lot of debating. I'd like to make another point that in, in uh, last year, uh, December the 10th, uh, my organization invited Stephen Gash for a debate on is Islamification of Britain, myth or reality? He pulled out a few days before that. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. You can just afterwards, afterwards. Okay. Anyway, now he said, uh, I want to ask the points he said at the beginning. He said that the, the um, West is summed up by democracy. So whatever the people choose is correct. So if the people choose to massacre a minority of their population, let's say the Jews, then it should be correct according to the criteria of Stephen Gash. No doubt, perhaps, this will allow him in the future to, have, to, have, uh, to do, discharge some uh, agendas that he might have against the Muslim population, another Semitic religion, uh, which is with the same kind of law system. In fact, virtually an identical law system to uh, the Jewish faith. Uh, I'm sorry. Now, uh, also, they said that Muslim, uh, so women only got the vote 100 years ago, while in Islam, uh, 1,400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad requested the Pledge of Allegiance from women and men, and that's in the text. Um, also, the other point is Saudi Arabia is an Islamic state. Um, are, you, are you kidding me? It is a monarchy. And as a monarchy, they, uh, uh, everyone knows that interest banking is forbidden in Islam, but yet Saudi Arabia has interest banking. It applies the, uh, the Sharia for stealing on poor people, of which Islam says, and there is strict hadith on this, that if a person is poor, you can't punish them for stealing. It is the fault of the state, they should have provided. But in Saudi Arabia, they punish all the poor people and the rich side of the royal family go away for free. They don't get touched. They, they are, have legal immunity. That is not Islam. The only state that you can see which would be Islamic is a caliphate. The caliphate is the Islamic model. There is no caliphate for 80 years. So we can't say oh, which, which model of state is Islamic. Now, even the Shias believe in a caliphate state, although they have different criteria who can be that caliph. Iran is a model based on Plato's Republic, where the philosopher ruler, with uh, Ayatollah Khomeini fancying himself as the philosopher who knows better, Wulat al as they call it, and it also has the same structure as the uh, British uh, system with uh, two, two houses of parliament and, of course, a uh, supreme leader, although I don't think the Queen issues fatwas anymore. <laughs> Um, he said that, that Islam doesn't give Muslims rights. Well, I like to quote, let's deal in text. Let's not deal with what I say. And I call Stephen Gash, I'm a lying Muslim. So, I'm going to deal, yeah, there he goes. So, reminds me of that, that, that excerpt from the film uh, Kingdom of Heaven. Well, that's a Saracen, he lies. Anyway, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, the Prophet Muhammad said, in the, in the book of Hadiths, he said that whoever oppresses, a person who is under covenant, a non-Muslim, in living in Islamic State, or oppresses him, or imposes on him something more than he can afford, or humiliates him, or takes anything from him without his consent, I will oppose him on a day of judgment. The Prophet Muhammad also said that anyone that harms a dhimmi has harmed me. Yeah? And the word dhimmi means a person under contract. It is no different to the Rousseauian citizen contract, whereby the state is under contract with a citizen to provide minimum protection. Point, yeah, no, sorry. Um, now, I can, uh, now, I'm totally happy to debate this entire subject on what the text actually says, including when the sacred months have passed, sl is, uh, killed infidels, wherever you find them. Let's quote the entire surah. The entire surah says about those polytheists who were in an alliance, or not alliance, an agreement with the Muslims for a, a neutral non-aggression. They broke the agreement. 
So, the, so what, what, did the, what did the Quran reveal? It said, when, when, the verses, when the months are over of this agreement, when it's over, then attack these people. But the Prophet Muhammad also said that you don't attack the women, the children, and the, 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 the oh, man who's <laughs> tilling along. This is a text. I'm sorry, my friend. We, we live in a free state where you can express. Do not impinge upon my freedom to express myself. <laughs> Okay, um, he says, why, why don't we see Muslims challenging these extremists that come on media, on, on TV and so on? We held a debate, we invited the BNP to uh, criticize Islam on a public platform, much to the UAF as a, a disgruntlement with this. And we begged all the media organizations, come, come see, come see Muslims giving a free platform to the BNP, the, 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 one of the most ardent ardent detractors. Our most ardent I'm talking about the BNP. Anyway, we beg. The BBC, Channel 4, we beg ITV, we beg every media outlet we could find to come cover this. We'll show you Muslims supporting free speech. It wasn't newsworthy, they said. Wasn't newsworthy. But Andrew Chowdhury spouts his mouth. Oh, suddenly they're at his front door. He's got, he's got um, MI5 on speed dial, according to what he admitted in public. And isn't it funny, MI5 are providing him protection. Why? Because he is the darling of the media. He gives a sensationalism that makes you want to buy a newspaper, a Daily Mail or the Sun or whatever. Right? And this is the problem, that we Muslims who, who um, did our best to try to display an, a an action showing that we support open debate, which is an Islamic concept by the way, uh, this, this was not allowed to be shown by the media. And that's why you don't see Muslims opposing uh, uh, and in charity because the media will not show you this to you. So, just, I'm talking about the BNP. Are you going to go conscious? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Excuse me, excuse me. Mr. Gash, he has the floor. Please respect our rules. If not, we have to escort you out. So please, I understand. Please. It is now Mr. Al Andalusi's chance to speak. He has 10 minutes to speak. Please respect us. I understand how you feel, but again, we run by rules. This is a debating society. Please adhere to the rules. Thank you. Okay. Anyway. No. <laughs> anyway, now on to secularism. You know, is religion a threat to secularism? I'll tell you this. I think secularism does not. Terrible. Okay. This is supposed to be a public free excuse, speech. Excuse me. Excuse me. We have rules. Mr. Gash was informed of those rules. We have to follow this. This is what democracy about, is about. This is what freedom is about. Mr. Al Andalusi has the floor. He's entitled to complete his statement and to take any points of information that he deigns to accept or to reject. Please respect those rights. I know this is a contentious debate, but again, we're not going to finish this debate on time unless we adhere to these rules. Mr. Al Andalusi, again, please continue. Thank you. No, I, I wish he came, he'd come back in. I, I was silent when he was uh, speaking, and I wanted to have, use this point in time to rebut. And of course, you know, um, there's so much to discuss. But secularism itself, very interesting enough, and you, everyone who reads the history of secularism, borrowed some main proponents of its, uh, of its social theories from religion. It depended on religion for the, the issue of equality. Equality was the final, came from a Judeo-Christian tradition. 
Like, why, why, how are we all equal? We are all, uh, we are all just uh, uh, matter or uh, uh, human beings or so on. Fine, but some human beings are more intelligent than others. Some are stronger than others. Some come from uh, you know, more wealthier families or, or have better genes or what have you. Yeah? Plato in his Republic says continually that we're not equal. Human beings are not equal. Uh, so, right, I love that point. Regardless of the source of secularism, right? It is, <laughs> it is a truth that secularism and religion are incompatible, as we know. Hold on, hold on. But if secularism depends on religion to give it its values, then secularism is vacuous and empty without religion. <laughs> also, free will, sorry. Free will, free will, where does this concept come from? If you are a materialist, you're more likely to be in a determinist universe, not in a, a, in, a, a, in a capacity for some intrinsic capacity of human beings to have a free will, undetermined by external environmental or genetic factors. Also, the a morality system, which, let's face it, I think across the board, every historian admits that was borrowed from Christianity. In fact, John Locke and many of these people were Christians. John Locke was a practicing Christian, a very devout religious one, and he even wrote a book on the reasonableness of Christianity. John Locke, that, that is, it's a true point. What does rationality bring you, devoid of, devoid of religion? You get utilitarianism. Ben from the Mill both discussed how it was justified for imperialism of uh, the kind of lesser, lesser civilized peoples of the world. Yeah, you can read it. This is the white man's burden, as it was called. Now, this is what you know, secularism needs religion to rein it back its materialistic tendencies. Nationalism has caused more wars and more death and suffering in the last 100 years than religion has in the last 500 years. Nationalism is the new uh, sectarian divide. Well, why is, it, why is it that a human being in, in, uh, in for example, uh, Ma that Maggie McCann, she, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman, why is it that she was more important than the hundreds of, of dead um, Iraqi female children and so on? That is, no, no, no. It is nationalism that separates us from looking at each other as one holistic humanity. humanity. Nationalism is the, is the true threat. And if you, if you were to say that the West is based only on nationalism, then maybe Islam is against the West. But it is not, because I've seen in the West, and I've read from the political philosophers of, of the West, a desire to improve humanity. We will not be stuck on any one particular dogma that the West currently adopts, and now we have to preserve it against, against uh, the, the tide of change. The West has always been about change. We should embrace change. I'm not saying to establish Sharia in, uh, in the UK. In fact, I would say that the, the, in Islam, as Muslims, our, our duty is to be, uh, our main duty to spread Islam is to be models of justice. Oh, no. the, best way, wait, the best way for me to spread Islam to you guys is that I go to the Muslim countries and make our countries a model of justice such that you see um, that we are an enlightened and civilized uh, 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 nation and civilization. And this is the point. I will say this, that the West itself is not even entirely secular. If you've got a National Secular Society website, you see them constantly bemoaning how unsecular the West is. In fact, I doubt you can find a country in the West that secularists are totally happy with. So, in that sense, if the West is not even entirely secular, then where is this secularism that is an enemy to religion that is causing Islam to be a threat to the West in the first place? It doesn't exist. All right, also, I think, and, uh, I think finally to kind of uh, wrap up my point, what you do see, what you do see in the world is, what was stated, that this, all this terrorism, all these actions that you're seeing, you see stated by the people, uh, these extreme nutters like Osama bin Laden, thank you, you see uh, uh, by um, the CIA themselves, the, the, the heads of CIA report this, but the main factor, wait, wait, the main factor, or almost the, the sole determining factor of terrorism occurring in the West is foreign policy and not ideology. In fact, Osama bin Laden, uh, bin Laden himself said, that he doesn't care about Western freedoms. He cares about the Western designs in the Muslim world, the supporting of, of uh, various regimes like Saudi Arabia. Osama bin Laden is upset with America for supporting the dictatorship of Saudi Arabia. Now, Osama bin Laden's methodology is incorrect because he advocates killing uh, uh, human beings. <laughs> right? But wait, wait. But I would say, I would say that Osama bin Laden is a bigger believer in democracy than us. Do you know why? Because Osama bin Laden truly believes, he truly believes that the government of the West that does these attacks and bombings and killings of civilians truly represents you guys. So he, he blames you guys. But we all know better. We all know that governments uh, in the West, unfortunately, are not uh, fully democratic. They don't represent the peoples. And that we are unfortunately dragged into wars not of our own choosing. And I'll lastly say, and I'll lastly say that, that if you vote 
for the uh, for the proposition. <coughs> If you vote for people like Stephen Gash and the other, other people who discuss their points, you are, no, you are supporting nothing different than just Captain Ahab's Moby Dick in the search for an enemy in his in troubled times. Thank you. attending this very controversial, very contentious debate. As you can see, there, there is a lot to cover this evening. And if you could, uh, before we end the debate, I just want to have our entertainment officer uh, put out a few brief announcements. But before I do, first, thank you again for coming. And Abid, you have the floor. Uh, hi, guys. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, tomorrow night, we have an open mic night. Uh, we've got a late start at 10 o'clock, so you guys can go see the fireworks and come back. And Saturday night we have a silent disco uh, in the chamber. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Eyes through that door, nose through the other, abstentions down the middle. Have a good night.